There's always another level of proficiency, of perfection, style, feel. Be open, have an open mind to the different styles. Learn how to play everything. Know how to play a bebop feel. Know how to play a left-handed Texas shuffle. Paul, your name comes up and every possible artist that is out there that has made a difference in the music industry, you've had a connection with them. It is really amazing. Well, thank you. It's I'm amazing the powerful work that you have done and continue to do at an incredible pace. It's amazing to me. Uh, I'm <laughs> just, uh, I feel like the most fortunate person on the planet to still be working. From talking with the with the cats in, uh, in LA when I was doing all the television work and movie work out there, they all said, your record career will be over when you're 40. They, <laughs> they'll start calling the younger cats and your record career will be over. So don't turn down the movie dates, don't turn down the TV dates. Because some of the guys back then, there was so much record work that Hal and, of course Hal did everything, but a lot of the guys, Tommy and and Chuck and the guys would would uh, they were with the wrecking crew. They would turn down a TV show to do a record date, right, right. which that made sense. Yeah. But and there were so many record dates, they would end up turning down a lot of TV. <laughs> but then when they hit their 40s, then the young cats coming in, yeah. they didn't have the TV to fall back on. And then other guys like Steve Schaefer, who'd concentrated on TV yeah. and that, their careers continued on. So. That was, a, that was one of the first, I've always listened to the guys ahead of me. Yeah. I've watched the guys ahead of me. And, and the guys, uh, of course, Ronnie, Tut, and Jerry Chef, that were like family. I saw when Elvis died, in, you know, they were one heartbeat away from being out of a gig. They mm. put all their eggs in that basket, right, and right. it got tough for them till they reinvented themselves, like we've all done over the years, right. reinvented themselves and found another way to get back into the business. And that's the open-mindedness of that, to reinvent yep. yourself, to be open-minded enough to be able to see that there are other opportunities in the music industry. We may have to just change our path a little. That's right. Yeah. A perfect example is when uh, all the electronics start coming in. Mm -hmm. In Nashville, a drummer in town, uh, James Stroud, that played on Forever and Ever Amen with Randy Travis, great drummer, turned producer. He calls it the long weekend. Around 1983, seemed like all of us had great time up till Thriller came out around 83 when it seemed like everything had to be then the met, metronome it had to be perfect Absolutely. so everybody had to start playing with a click yeah. and a lot of guys just said I'm not gonna play with a click I'm not gonna do that it's not what I do yeah. right yeah. when the electronics came in and you had to make the decision some some of the older guys said I'm not gonna do that I'm just gonna play the drums and that's fine you can make that decision but Keltner and I, we got into the S, I can't remember it now, the, the Oberheim, or the Lindrum, the Lindrum and the Lindrum, yeah, and, yeah. The, and the Simmons drums, and the <laughs> next Simmons drums, and, and all that. You just had to. But you learned it. You opened up your mind to step into yeah. it and learn it, and that's a very, very powerful understanding for this next generation to realize that you were able and willing to adapt. Yeah, you have to adapt. You, you have to look at it. You can't just go, well, I'm, I'm just a player. I'm just going to play jazz. We were talking earlier about the guys in Dallas in the, in the early 70s. They'd come out of North Texas and want to come to a session, and so I'd take them to a jingle session yeah. or take them to uh, where we were. I was doing all the shotgun packages for uh, WLS Chicago in 73. Mm. Those, those are the same shotgun packages, by the way, on uh, iHeartRadio on the 70s channel. Absolutely. It's still me going, Chicago. WLS Bop Chicago. That's all still, that's all, those packages are still being played. But anyway, they didn't want to do that. They wanted to play jazz. So yeah. they'd say, well, I want to move to New York and play jazz and starve, and I'd say, that's exactly what you should do. And you wanted more of a pop yeah. focus. I wanted to hear myself on the radio. Yeah. I wanted to, you know, I heard the Beatles too, just like everybody else absolutely, did. Absolutely, absolutely. And once I heard Day Tripper, it was like, oh, oh man. <laughs> that was it, that was the Is that the coolest thing ever? What's amazing is that you mention names like, you say Hal, and we have to understand that that's Hal Blaine. Hal Blaine. And Hal Blaine, who we've interviewed here at the sessions, oh, a love. fantastic interview, My what it was. You mentioned Keltner, that's yeah. Jim Keltner, who we've also interviewed here. So Fantastic. the capturing of these people, when they hear certain names, I, I want the audience to do the research. Do the research who these names are, because they were important names to research. Steve Schaefer, these are great, great names of people that are out there moving the industry and the art form forward. 
I've had drummers come up to me and I've asked them the same question. So do you know who played with Elvis? Live, yeah. primarily. Yeah. Do you know the guys that play with Elvis? Ronnie wasn't the only one. You know, yeah, yeah. Do you know who the guys that did the records? Yeah. Different guys did the records right, and right. did the, like always. Uh, yeah. Do you know who some of the big band drummers were with uh, Duke Ellington? Yeah. Uh, you know, th they don't know. Yeah. They don't know. And my band director uh, was one of my first angels. I, I've had these angels in my life that come into my life at a certain point and help me move to the next level. Mm. And uh, it's I just um, it, it's just been incredible. I, I don't know how I've been on 250, 300 million records. I don't know how that's happened. <laughs> I've just I just took the calls, right? But it's happened, and you have maintained the <laughs> highest quality of performance on each one of those recordings and every live date. That's an incredible personal constitution that you have. Well, thank you. My band director said, "Listen, listen to who's doing what, right. and think about why they played that." Right. This is when I was 14. Yeah. So I got my hands on everything. When I heard Louis Belson, a family friend, yeah. brought the recording with Louis from about 1952. He'd written a chart for Ellington and it, Skin Deep. Skin which, Deep. Which of course you're familiar with. Absolutely. Louis was a dear friend. I'm almost, I'm almost tearing up now. Beautiful Just, guy. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. Louis, was my very first hero. He's like, he, Louis was like God to me. <laughs> so, because at uh, 10 years old, I didn't know who Louis Belson was. Yeah, yeah. But my uh, friend brought that, and so I just heard that sound, and later on I learned it was Louis. So, a, a quick story, fast forward to, let's see, that, that was about 1960, that would have been about 1962. Fast forward 20 years, to 1982, and I'm doing the Grammys, right? <laughs> and I, we go upstairs, we rehearse for the Grammys, we go upstairs to catering, and then we're gonna go back down and shoot the show, right? So I go up and get my food, and I'm sitting there, and there's an escalator, and I see Louis Belson come up the escalator, <laughs> and it was like God arriving. <laughs> I looked at him, and I just went, You'd have no idea what, <laughs> how much I love you. You have no idea what, 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 how my career, you, you started this whole thing. I, I, you know, I, I'm just looking at him. He goes over and gets his food, and he comes and sits down right oh, beside me. Fantastic. There was a hundred places to sit, and Louis sat right there. And I, I can't eat. I can't freaking eat. And I, 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 I'm like, I'm getting all nervous right now. Just, and I just, finally, I got the words out. Louis, I know you've heard this a million times, <laughs> but you are the reason I'm here. You've been the biggest inspiration in my life. Beautiful. And I, I just can't tell you what you've meant to, to myself and my family yeah. and Beautiful. my career. Beautiful. And my life has been so much better with you in it. Wow. And he was such a gracious cat. He just said, he said, Paul, I, I know you guys are carrying the ball now, and he said, uh, you're, got, you're doing a wonderful job, I know you work, and he said, you guys have it now. Yeah. The so graciousness, it was beautiful. The, it was beautiful. The, the humility of this man, Louis was absolutely a saint, and he was just such a, a pro all the time. I had the chance to study with him and go to his house, and Pearl <clears throat> Bailey would cook for us. It was just an amazing experience. Oh, that's he was wonderful. just so loving, oh, he was. and you felt that in his music, not only as a drummer, yeah. as an arranger, yeah. And as a writer, it's a very, very profound <clears throat> composer Louis was. And, right. and still to this day, his website, which his wife Francine keeps going, yeah. has music and, and music that you can still track down. And it's important for that younger generation to find out who Louis Belson is. So if they want to understand who Paul Lyme is, they got to go and they got to study Louis Belson's. They gotta, yeah. You got to go back that generation to see where they are. I asked Ronnie Tut one time, I said, you know the opener for uh, for uh, C.C. Ryder, you know, the, the opening that, of yeah. course, I had to play doing all the Elvis shows when, when he couldn't do them for Graceland. I said, you know, where'd you get that idea? He said, it's Sing, Sing, Sing. <laughs> it's Sing, Sing, Sing. He got it from, uh, mm. uh, from Krupa, yeah. From Krupa. He said, I love Krupa. Krupa was my hero. Yeah. So that's a whole that's a whole fifteen year generation. Absolutely. So the generation after Krupa was Belson. 
<laughs> who was my my hero, yeah. but Ronnie Tut, who's the generation basically ahead of me, he's about 13 years older than I. Yeah. Uh, his generation was Krupa. Krupa, yeah. So he did that. He's even got <laughs> Ron plays it. It's more rock. Yeah. It's in there. So you know, we all. If you're not listening to the guys that came ahead of you mm -hmm. right. and listen for why they played what, when they played it, and the historical value of that, if it's successful, and if it sold a million records, or 10 million records, or 75 million records like Shania Twain, if you're not listening to why that happened, you're missing something. Right. That's the education right, right there. Right, right. You know, when I was in music school, uh, I, I, was, I was working six nights a week, I was recording five days a week at Robin Hood Bryan's studio in Tyler, Texas, <laughs> where all the ZZ Top hits were cut, yeah. uh, the early ones, uh, Trace Ombres, Rio Grande, LaGrange, all that stuff. So I was doing the jingle, American Airlines jingles and stuff during the, during the day, doing gigs at night and trying to go to college uh, in the daytime. And I was falling <laughs> asleep in theory class, listening to Brahms and Beethoven and stuff like that. So my, prof my old German professor came and he said, you have, what are you, why are you falling asleep in theory class? And I said, I work, I play six nights a week, and I record three, four, five days a week. I'm giving drum lessons, and I'm going to school, and I'm married and have a family Yeah. at 19. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> and, uh, and he said, well, you can't do that. And I said, what do you mean? He said, you need to take a loan from your parents and stop all that playing and learn, because the only way you can make money in the music business is to teach. How amazing. How amazing. And I yeah, looked at is, him, I said, is... I want to be a player. Yeah, yeah. He said, you're dreaming. You can't do that. My teacher. Yeah, yeah. And I asked him, I said, how much money do you make? <laughs> and he said, well, a tenured teacher can make twenty five, thirty thousand 30000 a year. And I said, I want to make a lot more than that. <laughs> you know, I want, I, want to, I want to make a difference. Yeah, and yeah, uh, yeah. so he, he said, you're dreaming. You can't do that. The bottom line is you took that and that propelled you to probably even push you further to be the success that you are, and that's the example, that you have to dream and then you have to pursue that dream. That's right, and you're gonna hit roadblocks. Yeah. And you're gonna, hit, you're gonna hit forks in the road where you have to make a hard decision, and I've hit them several times that we can talk about, but the decisions to go left or right are really hard sometimes, yeah, and, they're, yeah. can, they, and they can be painful, but you have to keep your eye on what your original thing was. Eye on the prize. You really yes, have yeah, to keep yeah. your eye on the prize, and you cannot let anyone stop you. Uh, Dan Huff and I have talked, and, and Dan has a saying. He said, uh, if you can talk your kids out of this business, they shouldn't be in it. Yeah. If you cannot talk them out of it, then they have to be in Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Uh, so, and at that point, if they're that driven, then they're probably going to make it. But even, I think, the people that aren't even physically qualified enough to make it. I think they will find their place Absolutely. In, in, inside of it. Right, and you perse know? perseverance, that willingness to continue and drive, will allow you to find your niche, even if it wasn't your initial dream, you maybe you'll find that niche that will at least satisfy you to have the value and worth of this career. Yeah, that's let's right. Go, let's go back to the beginning, in, in early on. What got you involved with drumming and what got you involved with just you know, pursuing music at an early age? When I was uh, 10 years old, in the third grade, I was beating on everything that I could find. Mm -hmm. I came from a poor family in East Texas and my dad cut me a couple pieces of doweling and I would play on the furniture and everything. My grandfather bought me my first drum when I was about seven. Mm -hmm. He bought me another one when I was about 10. I would go to every band practice with my sister who was in the uh, high school band, and I would sit in the drum section. This is at 10 years old. Mm -hmm. And I would go to every football game and sit in the bleachers with the drum section, and, and I just heard it. And the, dr and the drummers in the high school band would play something and I could play it. They'd play something else and I could play that. It was a natural talent I had, I, it, just a God-given talent. I just had something. Fantastic. And my band director saw it. And he was he would always let me be part of the drum section even when I was in elementary school. And so by the time I uh, hit junior high, I was the section leader in the seventh grade in high school mm. for the high school guys. Fantastic. So the school music program was a very important part of your development because right now the school music programs are falling apart dramatically throughout the U.S. I would love to go and talk at schools. I would love that. I went back to my school just this last year. Yeah. 
And there, there's not, that's not all that's falling apart. In yeah, this absolutely, for sure. Yeah. But I mean, from the music I, standpoint. I signed a quick, I took a bunch of pictures and I signed, may the force, since I did Star Wars, may the force be with you, Paul Lyme, and yeah. I'd hand it to him. And they stood there. And after, after I'd signed about 10 pictures, they're all standing there. And I said, what's what? And they said, can you tell us what it says? <laughs> and I said, what are you talking about? And they said, we're not taught cursive. We oh can't read what you wrote. God. Oh my gosh. I looked over at the band director and the, and the superintendent was standing I went, what? They can't read Kurt. They can't read. They can't read the grandmother's notes in the Bible <laughs> That's right. that, they, that grandma wrote 20 years ago. What? It has changed uh, as, as the world I hate, changes. I hate to get off on that, yeah, but, but that it was sad changed. to me. Yeah, it, it really is sad. So, yeah. so now um, you had mentioned your mom. Did your mom play a role in... in, in My in, mom would order these Reader's Digest compilation records. So Breakfast at <clears> Tiffany's <throat> and... Uh, for Ronnie and Teicher, she had this music going all the time. I just couldn't get enough music. I listened to, I listened to everything I could, everything she had. I'd listen. To, I knew a For Ronnie and Teicher record. I knew what song yeah. was coming next. I every moment I had, I'd listen to music. So when I got to L.A., of course, that's when I was 12. So when I started doing uh, movie dates uh, with Hank Mancini in '85. I knew his style. Yeah. I'd listen to every Henry Mancini yeah. thing that he'd ever cut. I'd listen to all the Pink Panther stuff and everything. Fantastic that, composer. And just Fantastic, yeah. wonderful guy. Just being immersed in it. But also being immersed in it and, and wanting to primarily be a player, but, but knowing that when the electronics came in. And now we're not selling records anymore. So like you've done, reinvented yourself. Yeah. And I mean, you're a fabulous studio player. There's so much home recording going on yeah. now. Things have changed so much. And with all the music that's being given what, given away, a perfect example, I'm on every Shania Twain hit. And with Shania, I think it's 75 million records just Incredible. on Shania. Incredible. Taylor Swift is every bit as big as Shania ever was. Yeah. I think Taylor sold 15 million records. Yeah. That's yes. a perfect example. We're yeah. selling one-fifth of the records. So there's just not the money to go down to make more records right. and more studios be built and more cartage companies. It goes all the way down through the cartage companies. Right, right. Cartage companies are failing and yeah. studios are failing because there's just not enough work going on. So we're all reinventing ourselves. Right. You've reinvented uh, this our artist studio access. Yeah. John Schneider and I started, John Schneider was a Bo Duke from Dukes of Hazard, and, mm -hmm. and he had five number one country records. So we've started a, a series that we put out a new song every week. Yes, like a, like episodic TV, like yeah. we used to do with Dukes of Hazard. Yeah. Every week we put out a new song. There's a new YouTube video, and we video every recording session, and he edits the recording session together so you can see us make the record because people all over the world have always wanted to come to Nashville and go to the studio. Yeah. So now they can. They can go on see us make the record and Brent Mason's on it and Glenn Wharf is on it with uh, Dire Straits and they can see us make the record and then they can go on CD Baby and buy the record. Fantastic. So we're trying to invent a way to make money in the music business again. Well, I mean, I could quit. I can quit right now. I don't want to quit. I, <laughs> I love it. We're having too much fun is what the reality yeah, is. Yeah, we love making music. How have you organized the business side of it? Because a lot of the kids that watch these interviews, they're confused about how, how, do, how have you managed to keep it all going? How has that worked? Like I said, the guys in, in the studio said, you'll be done with records by the time you're 40. Concentrate on another genre of playing music, yeah. uh, you know, working videotape, work under the television motion picture contract. But a lot of even that's gone away now yeah, because yeah. in movies, they're using songs from, they're using archived records right, instead right. of doing soundtracks. Right. The balance of producing, trying to invent new ways, staying up with what's going on. Uh, Yam Yamaha has been fabulous supporter. Yamaha and Peisty and Remo mm. have, been, uh, uh, have been such incredible performers. I, I don't have to worry about the equipment side. Right. That's all taken care of. I need this and it's there. It's hard keeping it all together. And... And with the challenges of also having to look to the future that someday you are going to retire. I've always had this mantra, save, your, save the first 10% of every check you get for yourself and yeah. spend the rest on everybody else. Yeah. It, <laughs> save the first 10% for you, because if it wasn't for you, that first 100% wouldn't be there. So right. save 10% of everything you make and invest it.
So how'd you organize with all these different acts that are calling you in these sessions and TVs? How'd you organize all that? Were there some times where you were being called for the same times and the same dates? And That's the hard part when it's really busy. We have, I always have two sets uh, and we call it leapfrogging. We used to do it in LA with uh, uh, the cartridge companies in LA. One, one set would go to Weddington, the other set would go to Universal. And then the set from Wedding, when I was at Weddington nine to one, and then Universal doing uh, Battlestar Galactica or something, that <laughs> set would go there. And, and then the first set, would go to Ocean Way, and I'd do Battlestar from three to seven, and then Lionel Richie at Ocean Way from eight till two in the morning. <laughs> and then a lot of times I would have a kit in Las Vegas, and when Doc was doing the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson, we, then the sets would leapfrog in town, meet Doc at Burbank, at uh, he'd get off the show at seven. We'd be on the ground uh, at 7.31 by Learjet in Vegas, change clothes, go on stage at 8, do an 8 o'clock show, 10 o'clock show, <laughs> get back on the Learjet, fly back to Burbank, be at Universal the next morning. That set would be there, uh, do a s session at Universal, do an afternoon session, get back on the jet, fly back to Vegas, and could do that for a month. <laughs> I, I passed out one, uh, one day at, at I lunch. Sure. I passed out at lunch one day. I started having these chest pains, and Tedesco comes back, and he goes, Paul. Oh, What's the matter? Everybody's going to lunch. And I said, man, I said, I'm just, he said, are you doing that commuting with Doc again? You're doing, you're doing it, man, you can't do that. You're going to kill yourself. I was 26 years old. I felt invincible, invincible right? And, and, I couldn't do it now. And Tommy Tedesco, one of the greatest guitar oh. legends, he called it like it was in oh. the fact that just oh, he would. amazing. That's too much. You don't need all that. I love Tommy. So you did all these dates. Is there any date that stands out that you felt that you, you learned an amazing amount about life and music from, from that performance or from that artist? Working with John Williams was a tremendous experience. Hmm. That, was, that was really something to watch John conduct an orchestra and, and set the mood for an orchestra. Because when we do uh, pictures, you have a, a, like an eight beat count off. You've done it before. Yeah. There's two bars, a click. And then, then the picture. There's a streamer that comes across, and so they like, the like they start yeah. this stuff. Uh, the streamer and the and the button comes across, that are edit points, and that's where the music starts. And he would talk to the orchestra. Okay, lightly now, ladies and gentlemen. The click would start. Lightly, ladies and gentlemen, very lightly. And the. No, or because he would just set the mood for the orchestra. And I mean, you'd just get chills down yeah, your back watching yeah. him conduct. He's, he was so fantastic. And what? then, of course, then, then when it was a, a big piece, he'd say, okay, with energy now. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> with energy, right to the downbeat. He would talk to him, talk to everybody right before the downbeat. He's, but what a brilliant, brilliant mind that you had the opportunity to work with. I mean, John has oh, done everything and continues to do everything. Yeah, his, uh, there was... A, a f real quick funny story here. We were doing a picture called The River. I'm on set. I would go over and help with Joe and Jerry and the cats over there in the, in the percussion section. <laughs> so, and of course, when the call used to come out, used to call from the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, right? Because because <laughs> John's father was a master timpanist and master percussionist. Mm -hmm. Jerry, his brother, of course, he's the Holy Ghost, right? So it's Father, <laughs> Son, and the Holy Ghost. So this one time, Jerry says, Paul, you're on temps on this one. And I... I was like, you're kidding me. <laughs> okay, he said, Paul, I've got them all tuned up because I'm, I'm not a mallet guy, right? There's another saying in Nashville, you couldn't pull an E-string through my butt with a John Deere tractor, right? That's, <laughs> that's how tight I got. So, <laughs> any, anyway, so, so I go over, and the first run, I'm so nervous, I can hardly get through it. And, and, and John, uh, and I went, surely he didn't hear, hear how bad that was. And John said, okay, that was really good, ladies and gentlemen. Let's do one more. And I got a second shot at it. <laughs> so anyway, the second one, I was fine. I went, okay, Paul, you can do this. But uh, that's the most nervous I've ever been on a <laughs> session is playing, uh, do, having a temp part, a multi- uh, five drum temp part <laughs> on, a, on a John Williams cue. So you, you've been put in situations that even though you might not have been prepared for, you had the skill to adapt at that moment immediately. Yeah, and, and great guys to be there. When, when yeah. Joe, uh, Joe Picaro says, save my butt so many times, yeah. and uh, all the guys, Larry Bunker, yeah, uh, yeah. Joe Picaro, yeah. 
Uh, Larry's gone. Is Larry gone? I think Larry's gone. Larry's Joe, Larry's Joe gone. we interviewed recently here for the sessions. Oh, uh, good. And we have him on that. His interview was absolutely wonderful. Oh, good. He, between Joe and Emil and Bunk, and I'd be back there. And, of course, I'm a drum set guy, right? I spent my life trying to be the best drummer I can be. And, mm -hmm. and you, they put me over. They, I, I told him, don't, just don't put me on a vibe part. I'm not. I can't do, I can't do <laughs> yeah. that. But that if it was a chime part or bell part, but of course, Emil invented all these instruments. If you don't know who Emil Richards is... Yeah, do the research. Do yeah. the research yeah, on yeah, Emil yeah, Richards. Yeah, yeah. He invented the water phone. He invented yeah. the water chimes. Yeah. Uh, it, he, he would invent these instruments. The scary stuff you'd hear in the movies back then. Emil invented the set of brass things. They were just brass plates and you hit them with a mallet, and they'd have a bong, 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 you know, and then you take, and he'd have a bucket of water, and you put your foot on this thing, and it had a, it had a pulley system, and you, you take one, and they'd, it, it, the, the cue on the, on the score would be water chime here, and, and start with the C note. So you do, Doo. and then as, you, as you're hitting it, it you, you lower it into the water, and as it went into the water, the pitch would change. And I went, can't, can't remember if it went up or down. It went in the water, it probably went up. So, oh, and you'd hit it and lower it into the water and back up. Now you do it with a synthesizer. Yeah, right. But that had to be invented. Emil Richards invented that stuff. Absolutely. And it's incredible. Look at the people you've had the chance to work oh, with and associate I, with. This is fantastic that you continue to, to you know, step into this world of creativity that is endless. It, it's just endless. These guys have so much knowledge. You know, Jeff was so lucky to be born into that family. I mean, and that family has suffered such... Talking about such, Jeff, Jeff such, Bacaro, yeah. Such sickness. I love yeah. Jeff so much. Yeah, He's just was, such you know. a natural player. And, but, and just such a, he was a great cat. Great guy, great player. Yeah. And, and as is with Joe, to see Joe Bacaro, the, the saint that he is. Oh, much, saint. Much like, much like Louis Belson. Yes. You know, they have that personality that's humble and kind and just, just a beautiful people to yeah. experience. And in this music business, we have such an incredible array of fantastic people that are with us to inspire us. Is there any, are there any events that stand out that were challenging for you that, that when you went to, you were like really nervous for, that you just were like, man, I am, you're petrified. Well, I told you the one about John, but the mm. one before that, I'll, I'm gonna confess to something I've never confessed to before. I was band leader for Linda Carter now and, mm. and, and producing John Schneider. These people that had these careers back in the 70s and 80s, they still want to do it too. Yeah, yeah. And so I worked with them. I did Wonder Woman, I did Dukes of Hazzard, and, and so they called me to get their thing going again. Nice. So we do Lincoln Center, Kennedy Center with, with Linda. But anyway, the scariest thing that ever happened, I was 19 years old and I was doing a lot of session work at Robin Hood Studio in Tyler. Right. I hadn't broken into, I was, you know, 19, and, 19 or 20, right, right around that time. This girl I was band leader for, Vicki Britton, got a record deal on MGM Curb. So they asked me to come out, which many years later I realized you never do this, with a studio band. So they asked me to come out and, and play her record. We go to LA and we're at Cherokee, what at the time was MGM Studios, they're on Fairfax. We go there, I put my drums in the cab. Back then you could fly anything on the airplane. <laughs> yeah. Put my drums in the cab, get them to the studio, get them all set up, and I start seeing these big cases come in. Larry Carlton, Victor Feldman, Max Bennett. Yeah. I see these cases come in, start coming in. It was Cartage. Yeah. I'd never seen Cartage before. <laughs> I went, these guys are so successful and so busy these names I've heard, they have moving companies move their equipment. <laughs> I've never heard the term cartage before. <laughs> they have moving companies move their equipment for every session. <laughs> uh, and here I am setting up my drums. Artie Butler was the arranger. Full simul date, horns and everything. We are doing a, a song called Flight 309 to Tennessee. And we'd played it and played it in the clubs and rehearsed it and everything. Of course, we get out there and Artie Butler had rearranged it. That's yeah. what he's paid to do. Yeah. <laughs> so we start playing this song and that I knew, and I kept running out of music. I just ran, would run out of music. And the band kept playing. I'm going, oh, God, what's going on? 
why can't I figure this out? <laughs> and so finally, after about three times, I'm the young kid on the, all the pros are there and they brought in somebody that's not ready. Yeah. And Artie goes to the producer and Artie says, you know, I, this kid plays good, but he's not making it. And so they cr tried to call Hal, Hal was not busy. They tried to call John, Garen, he, yeah. was, not, he was busy. They ended up calling John Raines. Hmm. And John Raines, they moved my drums out of the uh, drum booth. John came in, set up, and saved the day. I went on the street. I was so upset. I'm about, I'm about to, I'm about, it hurts so much. Yeah. It hurts so much, it hurts that much now. Wow. I went running down Fairfax, and I was going to jump off the Santa Monica Pier, hmm. which now I know is 10 miles away. Yeah. I was, I was so upset I wanted to kill myself. Mm. And this bum, another one of my angels, yeah. on the street, I, I grabbed him and I said, where's the Santa Monica Pier? And he thought I was on LSD. He said, sit down here, kid, sit down. Yeah. And he made me sit down on the sidewalk and I was crying, I was, I was so upset. I was just, uh, my career, here I am 19 and my career is already over. Mm. So I sat down, he walked away, of course I got up again, and I, it calmed me down. I would have run out in front of a bus. I, I was ready to kill myself, because hmm. I thought I was such a failure. I called my mom, I found a pay phone booth, I called my mom, and uh, I said, Mom, it's over. I, I'm not good enough, I can't do this. I'm not good enough for this. And she said, son, you're only 19. You've got a long way to go. I went back to uh, Dallas. By this point, Paul Guerrero, was, who had been at North Texas, Paul Guerrero was now the head of the percussion department for SMU, and he used to come in the club and listen to me play rock and roll. And I called Paul and I told him what had happened. He said, I want to meet with you every Monday, and I'm going to give you all my materials. And he said, I will teach you how to read. Oh, let me back up. You know why I ran out of music? I was so nervous. You didn't fold it out. I didn't fold it out. <laughs> I didn't fold it out. <laughs> oh I blew God. the date because I was so scared. Yeah. I didn't fold it out. Interesting. Interesting. But it's the worst thing and the best thing that ever happened to me. I went back. I started working with Paul. I'd do my studio stuff. I'd play in the clubs and I'd practice. I'd do all his stuff two hours a day. I'd, he had all these wonderful materials for reading and and seeing figures over and over and over again. And he'd say, for this figure, use the first time you play the piece of music, use this fill every time, the first time you play it. Yeah. Then, by then you know what the, is. then you can improvise right. the second time. Good. Never improvise, try to improvise while you're sight reading right. something down for the first time. Right. And so you'd see these do that, 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 ba doo do ba you know, play it, boo ba 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 do do da don't try to make it, right. f don't try to do anything, yeah. or just a Charleston figure. Just play this figure every time the first time. But just little tricks like that, and, and my two feet C thing that I came up with later, just little tricks that you, you learn to do, you're only gonna learn those from the guys that have been in battle. Absolutely. You're only gonna learn how to fight from the guys that have been in battle. So after studying with Paul, for two years, every week for two years, and doing all his material, Pete, Peter also studied with him. Erskine also mm -hmm. studied with yeah. with Paul in L.A. By 1978, I was doing the American Music Awards in Los Angeles. Episodic TV. I was doing Wonder Woman, Dukes of Hazard, Battlestar, Knight Rider, all that stuff. By '78, yeah. eight years later, I was back in L.A. and and part of it. That's amazing. So all this But time. it was the best, the worst thing and the best thing that ever happened to me. I swear I'd have run out in front of a bus that night. But what great experience that by going through this here, and the person you that's are. That's the first time I've ever admitted that, by the way. That's beautiful. Because, because it's, hard, it's hard to admit. It's hard to relive that for sure. But yeah. the fact that you allowed that to bring you to the level that you're at right now and the consistency of how you read, how you perform is at such a high level, that really was a very big part of the learning process that you needed. I, I didn't, I needed it. Yeah, I needed. Sometimes people need to go to jail to straighten their li yeah, lives out. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and I, I needed to go to jail. I was, I wasn't as cool as I thought I was. <laughs> <laughs> you know, these people that are watching, and I, and I want to ask you in closing. Think about these young kids that are watching this. What advice could you give to the next generation 
that could that could understand how they can follow their dream and pursue their passion of playing music. What would you what would you tell them? There is no prize. I thought at some point of my career it would be that's it. That it it's it. When you get to it, then there's another it. <laughs> there's always another level of proficiency, of perfection, style, feel. Be open, have an open mind to the different styles. Learn how to play everything. Yeah. Know how to play a bebop feel. Know how to play a left-handed Texas shuffle. Yeah. Know how to play brushes. When people call you, they call you because they've been told you're good. Mm. And I had someone tell me one time, when I was gonna go out with Doc Severinsen for the first time, I was so nervous again. I had this hypnotist, we called him Doc, and I went to Doc and I said, look, he doesn't know I might mess, he, they've called me to go out with Doc Severinsen. I was 22 years old. <laughs> Doc's called me to go out. He said, well, he's heard of you. He's heard you're great. I said, but he doesn't know I might mess up. He <laughs> says, of course he knows you might mess up, but he also knows you'll fix it. <laughs> and so, so these, yeah. these words of wisdom always come into your head, yeah. you know, and I'm, I'm always worried about, ever since the episode I told you about, yeah. I over-prepare for everything. Interesting. And Kenny does too. Kenny, Kenny, uh, Kenny Aronoff. Aronoff, he'll tell you. Great advice. He, Kenny and I talk all the yeah. time, and yeah. Kenny will tell you, he over-prepares yeah. for everything. Yeah. So once you see him play it, he makes it look easy. Yeah. But he's busted his ass yeah. to yeah. make it look easy. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what we do. Rehearse yourself. Learn every style, and don't think you ever have it under your belt. Make sure you have it under your belt before you show up the gig. The more proficient you get with yourself, the more proficient you'll be once you get to the gig. And the more confidence you have in yourself, knowing you might screw up, but you're gonna fix it. <laughs> if you have those two tools, yeah. you get the call, and you can fix it, you're gonna be okay. <laughs> Fantastic, Paul. You know, it's amazing how you continue with this youthful, enthusiastic approach oh, well, thank to you. life, oh. which that comes out in your music. Oh, thank Fantastic. you. Fantastic. On behalf of the sessions, Paul, we thank you so much. You've oh, done fantastic. Thank you so much for having me. Beautiful. Thank you, <laughs> thank you so much.